Hi everyone, thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Philomena, I'm the Marketing Manager at Ergomed, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar titled, Ergomed, the Road to GDPR Compliance. Before we start, I'd like to run through a, quick, a couple of quick housekeeping matters. Firstly, we expect this webinar presentation to run for about 30 minutes with a short amount of time for questions and answers at the end. And secondly, you're very welcome to send us your questions at any point throughout the presentation. You can do this by just typing them into the Q&A section and you'll see that in your window on screen. And now I'd like to introduce you to our presenter for today. Boschko Vojkic, who is Ergomed Group's Data Protection Officer. Boschka started with Ergomed in early 2019, and he is part of the cross-functional GDPR team who are responsible for Ergomed's current status of GDPR compliance. So without further ado, I'd like to pass you over to Boschka and we'll get the webinar underway. Thank you, Filomena, for this introduction. Hi, hello everyone. First of all, thank you for joining today's webinar and thank you for expressing a lot of interest for today's topic. Today we are going to speak about Ergomet's road to GDPR compliance. And uh, at the beginning, I would like to give you additional clarification or let's call it disclaimer about the title of this presentation. It is quite tricky to state that you are fully GDPR compliant, not because you are not doing something in line with the GDPR compliance, but rather because of the fact that you actually need to do some activities each day as your business as usual in order to achieve the necessary level of GDPR compliance, or at least to maintain the one that you already have in place. It is really my pleasure to host today's webinar, and I really do hope that you will find it quite insightful and quite useful. As well, today I decided that I'm not going to speak about the history of general data protection regulation. We are not going to elaborate each and every article of this regulation, but rather my goal is for all of us to have the better understanding of the privacy matter and especially the GDPR compliance. Um, that's why we are going to speak about the most important topics and matters to pharma industry, but as well, I still reserved one slide where I would like to speak about the most frequent misconceptions that I have been facing with in my role of data protection officer. I listed here four of them for you, and we are just going to briefly discuss them. Uh, well, first of all, the first question is what is personal data? And definitely when we are speaking about raw or full personal data, we do not have any kind of issue or question. But when we are speaking about pseudonymized or anonymized data, then this is a tricky area that we need to be really, really careful. As well, before continuing this, explaining this one, I would just uh, like to say that um, I'm not going to use extremely fancy, complex privacy definitions. They're quite nice to hear, but as I said, I want this webinar to be quite practical. So I will try to use really simplistic wording and language. And as well, I will, give, I will try to give you uh, real life examples. So pseudonymization is a technique that is making personal data a little bit more protected, or it is making a little bit more complex for you to identify directly or indirectly who the data subject is, but still pseudonymized data is considered to be personal data. Thus, pseudonymized data is still within the scope of the applicability of the GDPR. When we are speaking about anonymized data, it's not the same situation. Anonymized data is not considered to be a personal data, and that's why it is outside of the scope of the GDPR. When you have anonymized data, you are not able to further identify data subject directly or indirectly. So pretty much you will hear probably as much as I hear that uh, we are not processing personal data because we have pseudonymized data and we removed the full first name or last name or the full date of birth. And we only have initials or we only have the patient's identifier. Please be careful with this one because even though this data is pseudonymized, it is still considered to be pseud pseudonymized personal data. The next misconception is um, around the data subject. And again, to explain it really simple, um, it is important to know the data subject can be only a natural person. If we apply this to pharma industry or pharma environment, 
it can be patient, in case it can be reporter, principal investigator, or someone who is the part of the study stuff. However, when we are speaking about the information on the companies or legal entities, organizations, they, they are not considered to be data subject under the GDPR. So for example, Ergomed's company data is confidential data, is business specific and sensitive data, but it is not considered to be personal data. Thus, it is again outside of the scope of the GDPR. Third misconception that I hear quite often is about the term processing and what is definition for the processing. Here on the slide, you can see various different activities that are actually considered to be processing. And uh, even if you are collecting or even if you are just consulting with the personal data, you are still processing personal data. So pretty much you don't need to uh, physically process personal data to chop it, season it, and then consider it to be processed. Pretty much any kind of activity that is listed here, and please bear in mind that this is non-exhaustive list, is considered to be processing. And finally, one more matter that we should uh, elaborate on within this slide is the extraterritorial application of the GDPR, especially applied to clinical research. Of course, this is something that is really well elaborated within the provisions of the GDPR, but I will try to explain with the examples how this applies to clinical research. We have two main scenarios, and they are starting with the fact where the sponsor is located or established. If the sponsor is located or established within the European Union or European Economic Area, Regardless of the fact where the study is being conducted within the community or outside, GDPR always applies. It is quite simple scenario, number one, but with the scenario number two, we have a bit different situation since we have two sub-scenarios. First of all, let's again repeat that we have a sponsor who is non-EU or non-EEA. So let's say we have a sponsor from US. If this sponsor is conducting the study in European Union or European Economic Area and thus processing personal data of data subjects located within the community, GDPR applies. This is the prime example of extraterritorial application of the GDPR since the company who is outside of the community is still supposed and have the obligation to comply with the GDPR requirements. And then the second sub-scenario is the situation where we will actually not have the applicability of GDPR. If you have the sponsor outside of the community, let's say that the sponsor is from Australia and the study is being conducted in Australia as well, thus data subjects involved are Australians or people located in Australia, we do not have the applicability of GDPR. But again, please be careful here because the fact that we do not have the applicability of GDPR does not necessarily mean that we do not have data protection and we do not need to care about the privacy. We always need to act in this situation in line with the relevant local legislation. So when we go back to my example with the Australian sponsor and the Australian study and the Australian data subjects involved, we actually need to act in line with the relevant Australian local legislation and their local law that is dealing with the processing of personal data. Now I would just like to present that there are various different sections or let's say um, uh, topics that we are going to discuss today. And um, there are a lot of them, but we don't have a lot of time to discuss each and every. So we just picked some of them that we think are um, quite tricky and that you really need to um, think about when you are participating in any kind of activity that is within the clinical research environment. The first issue that we would like to discuss a bit more in detail is actually about the processing roles and the proper allocation of the processing roles. Whenever you are processing personal data, you can either have one out of two different processing roles. You can act as a data controller or you can act as a data processor. Pretty much, we will again use the Ergom as example to showcase that within the group, we are having both roles. For some purposes, we are having the role of data controller, and then for the others, we are having the role of data processor. Just to briefly sum up or explain the roles of the controller and processor, 
Data controller is someone who is deciding on the purposes for the processing of personal data. It is deciding on all the important aspects and details of the processing that is going to be in place and thus is fully responsible and liable for this. And then on the other side, we have data processor who is performing the actual processing of personal data, but on behalf of the data controller, or let's say it by following the instructions from the data controller. Usually when we are speaking about Ergomet performing CRO services or even pharmacovigilance services, we are always acting as a data processor because we have our client or we have a sponsor who is actually giving us instructions on how we are supposed to process personal data. But this, this does not necessarily mean that we are only acting as a data processors because there are some specific uh, purposes where we are processing personal data in a role of data controller. For example, for HR division, for our employees and their personal data, we are acting as a data controller, not only our employees, but our consultants as well and the vendor management. Again, if we are speaking about the marketing division, pretty much the same thing, we are having the role of data controller. However, let's go back to the Ergomed's role of data processor, because whenever we are processing uh, personal data for the Seattle, uh, purposes or the pharmacovigilance services, we are having the role of data processor. And one thing that is always crystal clear is that Ergomed or any CRO that is engaged is having the very same role and that's the role of data processor. As well, the sponsor is always having the same role because the sponsor is one who is deciding on the purpose why we are going to process this personal data and how we are going to process it. And that's why they're considered to be data controller. However, if we move a step ahead and then we introduce the site or the institution in this chain of different roles that are engaged, we have a bit peculiar situation or let's say in an answer that we have a little complex situation because this is something that is not explicitly regulated still. So site or institution can choose from various different roles. So right now we have a situation where site can request to act as a data processor or subprocessor, but as well site can request to act as joint controller together with the sponsor who is already data controller. And you will see the last, uh, the last possibility or option, and it's the one that we are facing with quite recently, where the site is requesting to act as an independent controller. Also, there is one term used in the some of the countries such as Italy, where the site is requesting to have the role of autonomous controller. Usually or all of our templates, especially clinical trial agreements, are drafted in a way to showcase that the site is having the role of data processor together with us as a CRO and the sponsor who is data controller. However, if we have the specific request from the site to act as a joint controller, of course, we are dedicated to really good communication with our sponsors and clients in general. And we address this issue. If the client is fine with this one, we just adapt the wording within our agreements. And then the uh, site or institution and sponsor are having this joint controllership. However, we are not considering that the site as an independent controller is the best practice, but still it is the practice and we need to um, you know, act every single time case by case and assess every situation diligently. So if you are CRO representative and you're in this position, for you, the most important thing is actually to have a great communication and collaboration and then inform about everything sponsor who is at the end going to make the final decision because they have the role of data controller as well. The next topic that we would like to cover uh, is titled Records of Processing Activities. And as you are probably familiar with, the GDPR is imposing the obligation to maintain the records of processing activities. What does this mean? Well, you're supposed to know what personal data you are processing, where this personal data is stored within your company, and then you need to as well address various different things that we will, uh, that we will elaborate right now. Uh, the good thing about this one is that GDPR is not stating or establishing the specific template that you need to have when you are keeping the records of processing activities. So you have the liberty to decide whatever suits the best your company and your business. So you can, for example, choose to maintain the records of processing activities in an Excel sheet 
where you will have various different columns that are going to address the following categories. You need to identify your processing role. You need to identify what is the purpose for this specific purpose per, for this specific processing. Then you need to address what categories of data subjects are affected, what categories of personal data, but as well, who are the recipients of this personal data. Um, you as well need to uh, know what are the technical and organizational measures that are in place for this specific processing. And finally, if there is a transfer of this personal data, you need to include transfer details as well. On the example of Ergomet Group, um, primarily we have the general records of processing activities. Here we are pointing out that we are acting as a controller, as I said, for the various specific purposes such as for the HR, for the marketing, for the vendor management. However, we are as well establishing separate columns where we are explaining that we are acting as a processor as well for the CRO services and for pharmacovigilance services. For us, our general records of processing activities is defined as per processing activities at the Ergomet group level. And then if there is something that is locally specific, we update this uh, records of processing activities locally. This is regularly reviewed and we are keeping the track of whatever is happening in all the um, local environments where we have our offices. But as well, um, next to the general records of processing activities, we are keeping the track about the HR records of processing activities. We realized that um, within this specific HR division, we are processing personal data for various different sub purposes, such as recruitment, employment agreement details, performance data, photo and recording data. And that's why we decided to keep this one as a separate as well. Uh, this is maybe quite useful for you as an advice because it will um, it will actually make the general records of processing activity more simple and you will not go into too much details because if you are having a lot of different processing activities, then this Excel sheet or if you are using automated uh, platforms, that's even better. But for example, this Excel sheet can become extremely, extremely complex. The next topic that would be like to briefly cover is a consent. And as uh, probably you are familiar, the consent is one out of uh, various different legal bases on which you can process personal data, or you can say that the, your processing is fully lawful. However, consent is um, sometimes defined as the one of the weak legal basis because pretty much with the consent we are having various different issues that we will elaborate a bit later. However, when we are speaking about the consent as the legal basis of the processing personal data applied to clinical research, pretty much in the majority of the European Union member states, we still have this as a requirement for the legal basis for the processing. As you can see within this table, in Austria, Germany, Ireland, Italy, Netherlands, Spain, you still need to have consent for processing of personal data when applied to clinical research. However, there are some um, different situations. As you can see in France, the consent is actually not the legal basis for the processing, but rather a legitimate interest. Or in UK, next to the legitimate interest that we already have in France, it is also well possible it is as well possible to process personal data when um, it is about the task that is in a public interest. Here, it is really interesting that in UK, it is explicitly stated that consent cannot be used as the legal basis for the processing of personal data applied to clinical research. Here, it is as well important to note that consent for processing is not exactly the same thing as informed consent form for the participation in the study, but if we are going to have a bit more time later, we will discuss this one as well. For now, it is just important for you to know that it's something that is different, but still we are able to include consent for processing within the informed consent form for the participation in the study. And here, um, for the first time in this webinar, we would like to share with you some of our tips or let's call it advice that maybe is going to be useful for all of you. When we are speaking about the consent, from our experience, the most important thing is not to assume that your sponsor knows everything about GDPR. 
quite often we have sponsors or clients who are located and established outside of the EU and definitely they're not that familiar with the European Union regulation as maybe we are since we are currently located within the community. So the first thing that you can do is actually to show them and elaborate on the things that they are not that familiar with and take the step further and advise and help with the GDPR wording. However, here you need to be extremely, extremely careful because at the end, even if you are going to advise and help with the GDPR wording when we are speaking about concept, but in general as well, you always need to seek the final approval from the sponsor because the sponsor is one who is having the role of data controller and they are supposed to make the final decision on this one. If you are going to advise and then take the further step and decide on your own on some of the changes, you can switch the role with the sponsor and then you can go as a CRO from data processor to data controller. And that's something that you don't want to be in a position with because then you have completely different scope of obligations um, than the ones that you have as a data processor. The next thing that is quite important, and probably this is the topic that was not that addressed in the beginning of the um, uh, all the activities that have been done for the compliance with the GDPR, but now they are uh, becoming one of the burning issues, and that's the data subjects requests uh, and data subjects rights. Um, GDPR is now uh, putting the data subjects rights, privacy rights on a completely different level and now data subject is having a better control and it can actually influence or give the input on how personal data should be processed. But in this table, you have listed all the rights that the data subjects are having per GDPR and we will not go through each and every uh, right now. But what is important here for you to know is that the first thing that you need to have in place is actually, or the first activity that you need to do is to develop and test the procedures. You don't want to be in a position where you will be facing with a data subjects request, but you will not have the procedure in place and then you will ad hoc um, act upon this request. You want to develop them and you want to test them before you are in a position that you need to deal with one. As well, our advice is to develop data subject request forms because this is something that is quite useful because you can include various different um, information that is quite important for the data subject who is requesting something. And finally, the final, but believe me, the most important step is to have the cross-functional engagement in your company. If you have someone who is dealing with the privacy matter, matters that is not the person who is going to be able to fulfill or to, to uh, be able to fully address the request of the data subject. As you already know, and if you're not familiar, this is something that you really need to keep in mind, GDPR compliance and in general data protection and privacy matters are never the subject or topic of solely exclusively one department within the company because this is the compliance of the whole business of all the aspects of your business so if you're not having the good communication with the rest of the departments of the huge importance such as operations business development legal it not even to mention and hr and marketing you're not going to be able to achieve the necessary level of GDPR compliance. And if you're speaking specifically about the data subject requests, definitely you will not be able to address one um, data subject request that you will be facing with. As well with this one, again, we would like to share some small tips with you. And um, based on our experience, there are three things that you always need to keep in mind if you're having data subject requests in front of you. The first thing is to confirm data subjects identity. Probably you're asking why. Well, it is quite simple answer. And the thing is that within the database uh, that you, for example, have in place, maybe you have two data subjects that are having exactly the same first name and last name. And then if you are not going to directly confirm the data subjects identity, maybe you will immediately act upon the request. And for example, if the request is the right to erasure, you will delete the, every single data that you have in connection with this first name and last name. And then accidentally, maybe you will delete or at least mess up the personal data of someone else, of the other data subject who did not request the erasure of the personal data. 
As well, it is always good to quote specific GDPR article that is affected. And this is something that you can always include with, within the data subject request forms, as we discussed previously as the second step um, uh, in, in these procedures. Um, and why is this important? Because you need to inform data subject about what actually they are requesting and what is the consequence on this? Because if someone is requesting the erasure of the personal data, you need to inform them that if you are going to delete everything, you will not have a single personal data about that person. And then if they're going to come up two weeks later and ask you to actually um, transfer that personal data to different data controller, of course, that you are not going to be able to do something like that. So it is always useful to inform data subject in advance about what they're actually requesting. And finally, it is quite important to ask for the signature and acknowledgement. This is not something that is mandatory, but it can be quite useful. And again, it can be included within these request forms because then you will have the written trail. You will have the written proof that someone actually requested from you to, to exercise their data subject rights. And then in the future, if you are going to um, deal with any kind of uh, controls or inspections or investigations, you will have the written proof that this specific data subject requested and you fully acknowledge this and you acted immediately upon the request that, that, that was shared with you. Pretty much similar story is going to be um, when we're speaking about the personal data breach. And here it is extremely important to know about the reporting personal data breach procedures. And first step is to actually identify what is your role. So if you're acting as a data processor, so on the example of Ergomet, when we are processing personal data for the purpose of conducting CRO services, we are having the role of data processor. If we are aware of the fact that there is a personal data breach, we are supposed to immediately without undue delay, notify data controller, the client, the sponsor, from the moment when we are aware of this personal data breach. It should be without undue delay because the data controller, in this case, the sponsor, is having only 72 hours to decide on the fact whether they are going to report it further on to data subjects affected or data protection authority, or um, there is no need for something like that. So pretty much act immediately. Don't wait for the next day gather all the information that you can have and share it with the data controller so they can have enough time to actually assess the whole situation and decide on the next steps. And then just to continue with this one, but when you have the role of data controller and we will look now this from the sponsor's perspective, they have the obligation to inform data subjects or data protection authority if there is a high risk to the rights of the data subjects that are affected they, they need to in, inform data subjects without undue delay, and they have to inform data protection authority within the 72 hours. However, it's not always going to be the situation that there is a serious personal data breach and you need to inform the data protection authority or data subject, but still you need to have this communication and you need to inform the data controller in order to make the possible the assessment of the whole incident and the whole situation. And again, to share some small tips uh, from our experience, it is extremely, extremely useful to document, track and store the full communication, everything that is in connection with the personal data breach incident. Be sure that your data protection officer or the someone who is dealing with the data protection inquiries is keeping the track of all this communication because in the future you will need to prove, for example, that you haven't decided to report to data protection authority, but you assess the whole situation and you realize that there is no risk to the rights of the um, and freedoms of the data subjects affected, et cetera. As well, it is quite useful to keep the, uh, all these trackers to better analyze the source of the personal data breach. If you are the company such as Ergomed, um, you have, or let, let's, let's, let's use the, our example, we have 20 plus different entities and affiliates within the group. And then it is quite useful to keep the track on uh, the fact if there is um, repetitive personal data incidents within the one entity, and then you can better understand these personal data breach pa patterns and you can prevent them in the future. So if you are able to realize that in one specific entity or your affiliate, you have a problems with the personal data breach, then you will immediately take the necessary actions such as 
again or um, um, issuing the re-education on the privacy matters, etc. So it can be quite quite useful for you to keep all these tracks um, and to document everything. And now uh, we need to speak about the topic that is extremely complex. And definitely we would need at least the very same amount of time that we have for the whole webinar to actually explain everything that is important here, but we will just try to um, keep it minimal and just to explain what are the things that you need to keep track on. And of course, we are speaking about personal data transfers. As I said uh, previously, Ergomed um, is currently having 20 plus, plus different entities and affiliates within the group, and they are spread across three different continents, Europe, Asia, North America. So we have some of the offices that are within the community that are located in EU and EEA, but as well, we have some of the offices that are outside of the EU. In addition to this, as well, we are having a lot of different clients and uh, subcontractors that are outside of the community. And that's why we are taking the transfers of personal data extremely seriously. Here, we will speak about two main differences. Um, the first one is speaking about the intercompany personal data transfers. And the second one is external personal data transfer. The second one is the one that we are all aware of, and whenever we are transferring personal data outside of the company. We really take care about that and we know what we are supposed to do. But sometimes there are companies that are forgetting that they are having entities within the same group that are actually located outside of the EU and they are each day sharing the personal data, but they are not having appropriate, um, appropriate safeguards for the transfer in place. That's why it, we in Ergamet decided to have intercompany personal data processing agreement and up there, we elaborate on how we are uh, transferring personal data within the all affiliates and entities within the group. First of all, if the transfer is within the community, everything is fine. We do not need to have in place additional transfer safeguards because it is considered that all the uh, member states where, uh, that are located within the EU are having the exactly same level of data protection. Uh, but if that's not the case, and if we are process processing and transferring personal data to the, our offices that are outside of the community, we entered into the European Commission standard contractual clauses to safeguard these transfers. As well, you have another option, and that's why it is in this um, lighter color on my slide, because this is something that we are not using currently, but definitely maybe it is applicable for your company. And uh, that's the situation that you can transfer uh, without any additional safeguards personal data to the countries that are on the list of adequacy. Currently within the Ergomet group, we do not have offices in the countries that are recognized um, as the countries with a adequate level of data protection. But for example, if you are within your company having the offices in Japan or Israel uh, as the countries that are recognized on this list, you can as well transfer personal data without applying additional safeguards for the transfer just because of the fact that their level of data protection is recognized as the same one that is acceptable in the European Union and European economic area. And then kind of similar, but with a small twist, is the scenario when we are speaking about the external personal data transfers. We will use the example of um, transferring personal data between the CRO and the client. So if the transfer is within the community, exactly the same as uh, for the intercompany transfers, there is no need to apply additional safeguards. If the transfer is to the countries on the list of adequacy, exactly the same. If we are transferring personal data to the countries that are outside of EU, usually we are entering into the European Commission standard contractual clauses. However, there are situations that we are as well relying on the exceptions, but, but as the name uh, it said that this is exception, it's used quite rarely. And for example, it is necessity test for the pharmacovigilance services when we are supposed to perform a specific transfer because this is the task that is in the public interest, for example. And then you can see the last one. This is the last possibility. And you can transfer the personal data based on the consent as well. But why it's in red? Because this is quite tricky and this is not the best practice that you would like to use and to have in place. Because, for example, just think about this situation. 
we are supposed, uh, we in the Ergomet are supposed to share the personal data and the CV of our employee to the client in order for the client to review the CV and to realize if our personnel is well qualified and then further on to meet the regulatory requirements. If we are basing this transfer on the basis of the consent, this is not something that is recognized the best practice because we have the disbalance of the powers. We as an employer are asking our employee to give us permission and to consent this transfer and pretty much we can all agree that the employee is not going to have the opportunity to actually reject this because then they will not be able to work anymore. And then uh, definitely this is not going to be freely given consent. So that's why you need to avoid this one and maybe just to use it as the last option or for the specific transfer that this is more appropriate, but this is something that we are avoiding all the time. And uh, pretty much we are relying relying on all four above, but on this one, we are, we are never trying to have the transfer in place with the consent as the basis. This slide is just here to uh, showcase the number and the variety of different legal contracts uh, agreements and documents that have been affected by the GDPR. So um, probably you will recognize some of them, and especially if you're in pharma industry, definitely you will uh, recognize the majority of them. These are all the different templates of the contracts that we have been updating in order to have them GDPR compliant. So pretty much every single template of master service agreement with our clients or without vendors is fully updated to reflect all the obligations and rights per GDPR, but as well clinical trial agreements, regardless of the fact if you are having the uh, two-party agreement with just with the site or just with the investigator or three-party with both the site and the investigator, if there is the applicability of GDPR, you need to update the wording to reflect uh, uh, everything that is imposed by the GDPR. And then we have various different standalone agreements that are of huge importance for us, such as data processing agreements, data sharing agreements that maybe are not that uh, famous as data processing agreements because we use these data sharing agreements when we have the situation of joint controllership. So when you have two or more data controllers, they're actually entering into data sharing agreement because then they are deciding and negotiating on all the important details and aspects of the personal data that is being going to be processed. Of course, consultancy agreement, confidential disclosure agreements, etc. But not only agreements, there are various different, uh, I've called it, even though it's not the most precise uh, terminology, clinical trials supporting privacy documents. But this is just to remind you that these are extremely important and you need to update them as well if uh, you have not been doing this already. For example, personal data information notice. If you are sharing this PDIN with, the, for example, principal investigator or the study staff that is engaged, you, need, you don't need the consent for the processing because you have the agreement with them or you are processing on a different legal basis, but still you need to inform them about the ways of how you are going to process their personal data. So we took additional um, initiative and we actually made several different templates of these notices that we are using um, case by case. So for example, if you need a general one, if you need something that is a completely ergonomic specific, or even we did one that is serving for the blinded or top line feasibilities, um, just in order to assure that we are doing everything in line with the GDPR compliance and that we are not going to do anything with the personal data that is not in line with the, all the requirements that are established for GDPR. And of course, informed consent form, if you include the consent for processing of personal data within the ICF, you definitely need to include and elaborate all the requirements that are established per articles 13 and 14 of the GDPR. And quite often you will hear, this is too extensive, this is too much, this is not necessary, and you need to include all of this. Unfortunately, yes, it is extensive, but you still need to include it. And we are all aware that this is making ICFs extremely long, not only ICFs, but all the documents, agreements, and contracts. But unfortunately, this is the complex topic and really sensitive topic, and you definitely need to include all this information in order to have the fully compliant document 
regardless if you're speaking about the ICF or the notices of, or the agreements. And this is um, um, just slide to showcase that we are doing a lot of different things in order to uh, have the current status of GDPR compliance. We will definitely not go through all of them. I will just pinpoint one that I believe that is, at least for me, it is the most important thing. Uh, and that's the cross-functional GDPR working team. As I previously said, GDPR compliance is the matter of the compliance of the whole company, of the whole group, of all uh, streams that you have within the company. And it is not possible to achieve the necessary compliance level if you are not having the cross-functional engagement of different teams. I'm extremely lucky that um, um, in my company, I have a huge support from various different teams, primarily legal team, and then IT, operations, business development, HR, marketing, etc. And uh, definitely it would not be possible to achieve all these different things that you see on this slide if you do not have this kind of collaboration in place. And finally, to conclude this part and to, to keep it quite short on this one is I would really like to again underline and emphasize the consequences of non-GDPR compliance. Quite usually I hear the following, tell me what is the exactly consequence of non-GDPR compliance in specific uh, scenario. That's something that is not possible to be explained, unfortunately, because the consequences um, are not that precise and they are going to be decided case by case by the, by the data protection authorities that are going to be involved. However, you can always say, and you can always list all of these um, consequences that I have listed within this slide. And purposely, I've put the reputational damage in the first place, especially in the pharma industry. This is most definitely the, the, the most serious consequence that you can face um, if you are non-GDPR compliance. Again, to just give you a simple, um, simple example, this is the situation where you are uh, that that you are having some kind of problem, and data protection authority is uh, saying that you are not GDPR compliant, and you are facing with a huge breach. I highly doubt that any client, any sponsor, any contractor that you can think of is going to be willing to actually collaborate with you in the future if you're actually having this kind of reputation. And this is something that can affect the whole, the whole existence of the business that you have. But as well, the rest of the consequences are uh, extremely serious as well, because you can face with the ban of processing, with the financial fines, with cancellation of the certification that you have in place, or even the cost of damage control can be beyond uh, expensive and definitely you don't want to be in a position uh, where you need to have the damage control in place. Well, this is everything that we have prepared for you uh, today. I really hope that uh, you will find some of the parts of this webinar insightful and practical for you. And um, it was my pleasure to actually elaborate on all of these aspects and to showcase what we have been doing, or at least just to, to give you a glimpses of what we have been doing in Ergomed um, on this matter. And I do believe that uh, we still have a couple of minutes for the questions that you have been um, that you have been typing in during the this webinar. So Philomena, can you help me with this one and just uh, read a couple of questions if we have enough time for this? Great, thanks for the great presentation, Boschka. That was wonderful. Yes, you're right. I can see we've had some questions coming in while you've been talking. So let's see if we can answer a few of them just while we've got a little bit more time left. Okay, so um, first we have a question here from someone at a UK-based CRO. What impact do you think Brexit will have on CROs and in general the entire pharma industry? Boschko. Thank you, Philomena. Well, this is a great first question, but definitely I will not be able to address it fully because we would need probably two more days or two more weeks to discuss about this one. But definitely this is the burning issue right now. And uh, my suggestion would be actually to, uh, to, to try to be fully informed about everything that is happening. Yes, definitely. After the end of, um, of the, the whole uh, Brexit withdrawal procedure, um, 
UK will be considered as the third country and that will affect a lot of different things and data protection and privacy matters as well, especially when we are speaking about the transfers. But still there are some of the uh, rumors that actually um, UK is going to be considered as the country that is um, um, having the adequate level of personal data protection that will be quite useful and we are all praying for something like this but still that's the thing we need to be updated and keep uh, us posted and informed about everything what is happening and uh, then just try to um, to to detect what are the most important parts that you need to work on especially if you are having transfers in place to UK or outside of the UK. And then one thing that is quite important to, for all of you to know is that currently there is the local legislation in UK that is fully in line with the GDPR. So at the moment when the UK is going to be considered as a third country and there will not be applicability of GDPR, they will still have exactly the same level of the compliance. But the problem is that in the future, we cannot be assured that they are not going to develop into different um, in two different paths. So we just need to follow this one. So Filomena, this is for the first one, but I believe that we still have a couple of minutes. So can you read another one? Yes, I'll be quick. <laughs> Thanks, Boschka, for that answer. Um, okay, how about one from one of our pharma colleagues? Uh, the question is, would it be okay to include the consent for processing personal data within a regular ICF? Yes, thank you. This is the question that I just touched upon, but I actually didn't um, discuss a lot. And that's why I see why you ask this kind of question. It's a really good one. Um, and to give you a simple answer, yes, uh, I believe that I already said that it is possible to include consent for processing within the uh, informed consent form for the participation in the study. But again, you need to be extremely careful here because uh, these two consents are not exactly the same thing. So even if you're including consent for processing within the ICF, you still need to include all the relevant um, features that one uh, consent for processing needs to have per GDPR. And then as well, it is not allowed to perceive that acceptance or consent to the ICF is automatically the consent for the processing. And probably you are now questioning yourself and the thing that I'm speaking about right now because it's not quite logical because if you are giving the consent to participate but not giving consent to for the processing of your personal data well you will not be able to participate in the clinical trial and yes this is quite peculiar situation but still we have the guidance that, um, that is now considered to be uh, one of the best practices that actually these are two separate things. So if you're asking for the consent for processing within the ICF, you need to treat it as a separate consent as well. Filomena, maybe uh, uh, one more minute for the last question. Yes, one quick question. Um, okay, so how about, and in fact, this is, something that has been posed by quite a few people listening in or a question along similar lines. How does one deal appropriately with requests from data subjects as these rights tend to be limited within the pharma industry and the clinical research environment? How would you answer that one? Yes, thank you. Uh, well, we already have the, the half of the answer and that's quite good because we can see that the, the all of you joining are actually having uh, already a great level of knowledge um, of GDPR compliance. And yes, these privacy rights are, or at least some of them are not unlimited rights. So the situation is like this. Data subject can always request the exercise of the data subject's right, but that does not necessarily mean that you will always um, uh, fully actually act upon this request or in, for example if someone is asking to delete all the data that does not necessarily mean that you will actually delete this one but what is important here it is uh, again to go back to the slide that we were speaking about this one you need to inform the data subject about consequences and then if you are going to decide that it is not possible for you to fulfill this request because there is a specific legal or regulatory requirement and you are not allowed to do something like this 
please be, be sure to communicate this to the data subject as well. So for example, if the participant in the clinical trial is asking you to delete all the data, you're not allowed to do something like that because deleting the data that is already collected prior to, for example, this request would affect the validity of the study and would affect the results. So you need to communicate that you are not allowed to do something like that, but definitely you can stop collecting any further uh, any further collection of the personal data and you will not process it further. Um, so yes, this is quite specific and the most important thing for you is actually to communicate well and to know your regulatory and legal obligations. So if you have one that is preventing you to fulfill someone's request, please communicate that to data subject as well. Filomena? Thanks a lot, Boschka, that's perfect. Um, unfortunately, that's all we do have time for today. Uh, I'm sorry, we still have a few unanswered questions, so we'll try and get back to everyone. We'll aim to get back to everyone by the end of this week uh, via their email. Um, okay, so to wrap it up now, uh, we'd like to thank everyone across the globe for tuning into the Ergamed webinar on GDPR compliance. We hope you found it both interesting and informative. Finally, we'd like to remind you that this webinar will be available for download from our website. Plus, we'll also have a link in our next webinar and next newsletter. Sorry. So, thank you very much again. This ends our webinar. See you soon.